The briefing that follows is titled, Taking the Battle Against Palestinian Terror to Court, which was given by Nitzana Darshan Leitner in 2003. Her presentation was recorded by IsraelNationalRadio.com, and we are rebroadcasting this briefing with their permission. The suicide bombing, the drive-by shooting, the ambushes that are devastating the state of Israel are continuing and continuing and there is no end in sight. The Palestinian organizations think that they finally found the key that will destroy the Jewish state and will drive us from our land. The governments of Iran, Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia are pouring millions and millions of dollars into the hands of the Palestinian terror organizations in order to keep the pot boiling and to make sure that more and more Jewish life will be lost. In the past several years, our organization, Shurat Hadin, Israel Law Center, has represented over 100 terror victims in lawsuits and legal actions that they were taking against the Palestinian terror organizations, against Iraq, Iran, Syria, the European Union, fighting terrorism in court. And let me speak to you about a portion of these cases. We are back in the days of the beginning of the current intifada, October 2000. Israel calls to a special military call-up. Two soldiers are called to their base in Betel. One, Vadim Nurjit from Or Akiva, got married one week before. The other one, Yossi Abrahami from Petah Tikva, was a father of three young children. They drive their car to their base, but they didn't know their way so well. They missed the entrance of the base. They made a little mistake. Mistake that happened to be the mistake of their life. They reached the entrance of the city of Ramallah. In Ramallah, they were immediately got arrested by Palestinian policemen who pulled them out of their car and brought them to the police station in town. They took them to the second floor. Very quickly, the rumor was spread that there are two Israeli soldiers arrested in the Palestinian police station. The mob began to arrive. They demanded the policemen to bring them down the two soldiers they wanted to lynch them. But the Palestinian policemen refused. Instead, they did the work for the mob. They used any tool they found in the police station. They used metal poles, they used sticks, they used their knives, they used their guns, and for half an hour they were stabbing and beating the soldiers to death. For half an hour, they were stabbing and beating the soldiers to death. But the mob demanded blood. So the Palestinian policemen took one of the soldiers, Vadim Nurjic, and dropped his body from the second floor into the crowd. And I don't have to tell you what the mob did to the body. You all watch it on CNN. They took the body, they ripped it to shreds. They took out the internal organs of the body, they dragged the body to the center of town and lit it on fire. In the end, when the body was turned into the Israeli forces, there was almost nothing left to say Kaddish on. If this thing would have happened anywhere else in the world, obviously the police and the state would be found responsible for this horrible lynching. It looked clear to us that the Palestinian police and the Palestinian Authority have to pay a lot of money for this murder. The problem was that nobody sued the Palestinian Authority before. Nobody ever brought the Palestinian Authority into a court of law. Nobody ever tried to impose responsibility on the Palestinian Authority for their horrible act. We took the risk and we filed a civil suit against the Palestinian Authority in the District Court of Jerusalem in order to make sure that they will be able to collect the judgment by the end of the road, we filed a motion for a preemptive lien to seize the money that Israel holds for the Palestinian Authority. This is tax money that Israel collects every month for the Palestinian Authority, but does not release to their hands since October 2000. We filed a suit and we served the PA with the papers. The PA hired a lawyer, 
an Israeli Arab from East Jerusalem who came to court and raised several objections. First, he said, the Palestinian Authority is a state, and since we are a state, we have sovereign immunity, we cannot be sued in court. Second, he said, under the Oslo Agreement, Israel has no jurisdiction upon the Palestinian Authority in their own court, therefore the lawsuit should be withdrawn. These allegations made me laugh. What do you mean you are a state? If you are a state, what are you fighting for? If you are already a state, what is the Intifada for? And what do you mean under the Oslo Agreement? Under the Oslo Agreements, you are allowed to shoot us from every corner? Under the Oslo Agreements, you are allowed to send suicide bombers to kill us? What do you mean under the Oslo Agreements? Since when do you respect the Oslo Agreements? But what shocked me most was the fact that the Israeli court needed time to weigh these allegations. It took the Israeli court almost two years to finally give a decision in the case. Two months ago, he came down with a decision. He ruled that the Palestinian Authority is not a state. He decided that the Palestinian Authority has no sovereign immunity and the case can go forward against them in Israel. They also granted us the lien that we asked for, for the full amount of the lawsuit. 64 million shekels. 64 million shekels are equal to 13 million dollars, are a lot of money for the PA. The PA is not allowed to purchase any more arms. They either smuggle it in or buy it in the black market. Every bullet in the black market costs one dollar. 13 million dollars are 13 million bullets that Arafat will not put his hands on meaning more Jewish life will be saved. As opposed to what most people think, the majority of the terror attacks that were carried out in the current Intifada weren't done by the Islamic terror organizations. They weren't done by Hamas or by the Islamic Jihad. They were done by terror organizations that belonged to the Palestinian Authority. They were done by Fatah Tanzim, by Martyrs al-Aqsa, by 417, groups that take their orders directly from Arafat. And the only way Arafat controls these groups is by funding them, is by paying their salaries, is by purchasing their arms, is by supporting them financially. I regularly meet with the intelligent agencies in Israel, and they all tell me the same thing. If you cut the funding, you can cut the terrorism. If you stop the flow of the money, you stop the flow of the terrorism. They need the funds. They need the money. They need the facilities. They cannot do without it. If I would ask you who is the largest funder of the Palestinian terror organizations today, you may tell me that it used to be Iraq. Iraq gave $25,000 to the family which the suicide bomber came from. Compensation or reward. You may tell me Iran. Iran pours millions of dollars into the hands of Hamas or the Islamic Jihad. You may tell me Syria. Syria, in the Beka Valley of South Lebanon, trains Hamas, trains Hezbollah, provides them with weapons. But I'm telling you, that the largest funder of the Palestinian terror organizations today is Europe. In 1994, days after the Oslo Agreements were signed, Europe and the United States agreed to help the Palestinian Authority to get established, promised to provide them with foreign aid. United States committed to pay the Palestinian Authority $500 million, $100 million per year for five years. They gave him the first $100 million. Several months later, the General Accounting Committee of the Congress wanted to know how this money was spent. The United States Congress approached Arafat with a question. No one, including Arafat, could provide the Congress with an accurate answer. The Congress hoped 
They were praying that Arafat just pocketed the money or sent it to his secret bank account in Switzerland. They didn't want to believe that Arafat did a horrible use with the money. No one until today knows how these hundred million dollars were spent, but United States Congress stopped funding the Palestinian Authority right then. Europe is a different story. Europe committed to pay the Palestinian Authority ten million dollars a month. They were doing it since 1994 until today. It comes up to 1.5 billion dollars. 1.5 billion dollars is supposed to go to humanitarian aid. It's supposed to go to the municipalities to pay the salaries of the garbage collectors, of the doctors, of the teachers, of the policemen, of the officers. It's supposed to build new clinics, to open new schools. It's supposed to repair the roads, the electricity, to go to infrastructure. But anyone who goes to the Palestinian Authority today realize that the Palestinian people are living in a dismal state. They are living even worse before 1994, before Arafat came from Tunis. The garbage is piled up on the streets. The officers are constantly on strike. There are no new clinics getting opened, no new schools getting built, no infrastructure. And the big question was, where did the $1.5 billion go? Israel was the one who raised the question. Europe approached Arafat with a question. Arafat was smarter this time. Arafat provided Europe with a written budget, a budget that he wrote how exactly he spent the money. Europe took the answer for granted. They didn't inquire, they didn't investigate. The reason was that Europe wanted to keep funding the Palestinian Authority. When the Oslo Accords were signed, Europe wasn't a party to the signature. Europe was left aside. In order to keep being a player in the Middle East peace process, Europe needed to have a role. And their role was to fund the Palestinian Authority. Israel began to receive information that Arafat takes the money and divert it to terrorism. They warned the European Union, the EU, that Arafat is using the money for terrorism. But the EU say that Arafat has no proof, that Israel has no proof. And Israel had a problem until April 2002. Last year, in the course of defensive shield operation, Israel invaded Jenin, invaded the Mukata of Arafat in Ramallah, invaded other places under the control of the Palestinian Authority, and found hundreds of documentation that prove that Arafat financed the terror. They found documents written in his own handwriting, giving instructions to his ministers to pay X amount of money for terrorists by their names. They found all the documentation about Karin A, the weapon ship that Arafat tried to smuggle in, all the millions of dollars he paid for it. They found checks that are signed by Moran Bergudi, the head of Fatah Tanzim, that today stands a trial in Israel for 26 murder cases. Checks that Moran Bergudi withdrew from the bank account of the Palestinian Authority and gave to terrorists under his control. They took all this pile of documentation and showed it to the EU. But Chris Patton, the foreign minister of the EU, said that he still doesn't see any proof. I saw that and I decided to take the EU to court. In August 5th, 2001, Stephen Bloomberg, a British citizen that lives in Israel, was driving home with his wife, Tria, and their oldest daughter, Tzipora. They came back from the hospital. Tria was pregnant in her fifth month. They just were told she was carrying a boy. They were driving their car, and in front of their car, there was another car. The car in front of them began to slow down. Slow down, slow down, too much. So Stephen Bloomer decided to go around the car from the left in order to pass it. The moment he did so, two Palestinian policemen that sat in the slow car opened fire 
on the Bloomberg family's car. They shot 17 bullets into the car. Tria Bloomberg, the mother that sat on the passenger seat, got killed on the spot. Stephen Bloomberg, an engineer in Israel aircraft, got hit in his spine. His daughter Tsipora, 16 years old, got hit in her spine. They are both paralyzed for life. We saw the EU. We sued the EU because the bullets that were shot into the car were purchased by the EU's money. And the car that they were driving was bought with the EU's funds. We sued the EU because the salaries that the police were receiving were paid by the EU's money. We sued the EU in the District Court of Tel Aviv, and we served the EU with the papers. The EU hired a lawyer, but they didn't come to court. They didn't come to court and say, our hands are clean, we have nothing to do with terrorism. They didn't come to court and say, we are not responsible for any terror attack that is carried out by the Palestinian terror organizations. They didn't come to court and say, we know exactly how our money is being spent and Arafat does not say very to terrorism. They said, we have diplomatic immunity. You cannot sue us in court. But I call upon Chris Patton and telling him, if you have nothing to hide, don't run to Brussels. Don't hide behind the immunity defense. Come to court. Come to court and prove us that your hands are clean. Come to court and prove us that you have nothing to do with terrorism. Come to court. Face the Blumberg's family. Look at their eyes. Promise them that you are not responsible for their mother's death. Ensure them that you are not the one who put them in wheelchairs forever. Sixty years after the Holocaust, Europe once again engaged with Jewish blood. When I filed the lawsuit, I made sure that the story would be picked up by all the European media. I was interviewed at the BBC several times. Stephen Bloomberg is a British citizen, and England showed a lot of interest in the case. Germany, in the Die Zeit magazine, wrote a series of articles about the story. French news agency wrote about the story. Italy reported about it, because I wanted to make sure that the European taxpayer will know how his money is being spent. I wanted him to know that when he turned on the TV in his living room, and he sees the moment cafe in Jerusalem gets blown up and 18 young people get killed. And he sees the Dolphinarium discotheque in Tel Aviv gets blown up and 24 teenagers get killed. And he sees the Park Hotel in Netanya gets blown up and 30 guests over Passover Seder get killed. He will know that it's his money that funds it. When European diplomats come to visit Israel, the Israeli government takes them to Yad Vashem. Don't take them to Yad Vashem. Don't take them to the Holocaust memorials. Take them to the cemetery in Hadera. Take them to the cemetery in Afula. Take them to the cemetery in Jerusalem, where the terror victims are buried. Let them walk between the graves. Show them the names of the children, of the fathers, of the mothers, that their money killed. The Tel Aviv District Court is now hearing the case. We claim that according to the Israeli law, the European Union does not have immunity in Israel. But if the District Court of Tel Aviv will rule that the EU has immunity, we'll take the case to the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court will decide that the EU has immunity and they cannot be sued in Israel, we'll take the case to their own court in Brussels. There, they don't have immunity. There, they will have to come to court and defend themselves. There, they will have the EU stop funding the PA. Because if you stop the flow of the money, you stop the flow of the terrorism. Europe is not alone. Iran pours millions of dollars into the hands of Hamas. In the beginning, Hamas and Israel were actually allies. 
Hamas was created in 1988, in the beginning of the former Intifada. They were the wing of the Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt. They stood for Islamic resistance movement. There was a small religious movement that all they care was religion. All they care was that the Palestinian women will be dressed modestly, the Palestinian men will not watch videos, and the Palestinian youth will not do drugs. When the PLO was calling to nationalism, Hamas was against it. Hamas believed that all Arabs belong to one pan-Arabic nation. When Yasser Arafat was calling to a bloodshed against Israel, Hamas opposed it. Hamas was calling their people to sit on their mats and to pray to Allah for an Islamic state. Israel saw that and mistakenly believed that the religion will opiate the Palestinians. They thought that if they let Hamas grow, eventually Hamas will overcome the influence that the PLO had over the uh, population in the West Bank and Gaza. So when Hamas wanted to open new schools, Israel allowed them. When Hamas wanted to build new clinics, Israel encouraged them. When Hamas wanted to give free food to the poor Palestinians, Israel allowed charities and foundations from all over the world to donate money to Hamas freely and openly. And Hamas grew and grew. In 1991, Hamas began to take militant actions against Israel. They saw that during the Gulf War, when the scuds were falling on the houses in Ramat Gan and Tel Aviv, the Palestinians were dancing on the top of their roofs plotting to Saddam Hussein, calling to a war against Israel and against America. Hamas realized the Palestinians want blood, and they were afraid that if they don't start killing Israelis, they might lose the Palestinian street. They began to kidnap Israeli soldiers in Gaza and to murder them. Israel saw that Hamas is no longer a small religious movement, but a terror organization, and decided to stop them right then. Yitzhak Rabin ordered to arrest all the leaders of the Hamas and to deport them outside of the country. The IDF arrested 415 leaders. They loaded them on buses in Gaza. No Arab country agreed to accept them. So Israel decided to let them go to South Lebanon and live in the refugee camps there. The buses took off. They were driving for several hours towards the north. They almost reached the good fence near Kiryat Shmona, and they were stopped. They were stopped by the Israeli Supreme Court. One hour after the decision of the deportation was made, Hamas ran to the Israeli Supreme Court, filed a petition, and said that according to the Israeli law, and according to the international law, Israel cannot do a mass deportation. Hamas, that doesn't recognize the state of Israel, that doesn't recognize any Israeli institute, ran to the Israeli Supreme Court. And they didn't quote the Quran, they quoted the Israeli law, they quoted the Geneva Convention that talks about human rights. They said that Israel cannot do a mass deportation. The Israeli Supreme Court being sensitive to its moral image, agreed with them. They say to the Israeli government that indeed they cannot do a mass deportation. And if they want to deport 415 leaders, they have to deport them, each and every one of them, separately. Each case on its own merits, on its own circumstances. They also limited the period of deportation for two years. And they warned the Israeli government that they will not allow such a deportation ever again. Few moments after the decision was given, the buses received instructions to cross the border of South Lebanon and to let the Hamas go to the refugee camps. All the media from all over the world rushed to South Lebanon interviewed the poor terrorists freezing in the Lebanese winter, being a part of their children, of their wives. 
They wrote cover stories about them. They took huge photos of them. But slowly, slowly, even this interest faded away. Everybody began to forget about the Hamas, except for one group, the Hezbollah. The Hezbollah, an Iranian funded organization that launched its own war against Israel from South Lebanon, received instructions from the Iranian government to approach the terrorists from the Hamas and to adopt them. Hezbollah invited the Hamas terrorists to come to their camps. Hamas accepted the invitation. They came to the camps of the Hezbollah and began to learn. They didn't learn how to throw rocks or how to stab with knives. They knew all that back in Gaza. They learned new things. They learned how to shoot a gun, how to fire a missile, how to create a bomb. And they learned the most important idea of being a martyr, Shahid. They learned that whoever fights the Muslims' enemies, the infidels, and gets killed, gets to get to paradise, and 72 beautiful virgins will be waiting for him there. This idea came from the Iran-Iraq war. In the course of the war, Iraq planted thousands of landmines in the border between Iraq to Iran. Iran needed to clear up the mines in a hurry. So they emptied out the elementary schools and high schools from students, brought the students to the border, and ordered them to clear up the mines, and promised them that whoever gets killed clearing up the mines that the infidels planted will get a reward, will get to get to paradise, and 72 beautiful virgins will be waiting for him there. They even provided them with a plastic necklace and a plastic key, the key to paradise. Loaded with this idea of sex and high explosive, Hamas terrorists wanted to go back to Israel. They didn't wait two years. After nine months only, they applied to the Israeli government to come back. The Israeli government, being afraid of another bad decision of the Supreme Court, allowed them to come in. These terrorists became the leaders of the Hamas organization. They became the mastermind behind all the suicide bombings since 1996, 97, 98, until today. One of them, Muhammad Abu Hanud, was the mastermind behind the Mahna Yehuda market suicide bombing in 1996, behind the, uh, uh, the Midrach of the uh, Ben Yehuda Mall in 1997, suicide bombing over there. Muhammad Abu Hanud was only recently assassinated by the Israeli government. But beforehand, he was responsible for the death of thousands of Jews. He didn't become a suicide bomber himself. He told the others how to become suicide bombers. He taught them how to build a vest, how many nails would be put inside the vest to get the best results, where exactly to stand on the bus in order to kill the most amount of people, how many suicide bombers to go to one place in order to get the best results. In both the texts, the Machna Yehuda Market and the Ben Yehuda Mall, he sends one suicide bomber to stand on one edge of the market. He dressed him up with a suit, let him carry a suitcase. The suicide bomber blew himself up. All the shop owners, all the buyers, all the people rushed to help the wounded. And then another suicide bomber that stood on the other edge of the market came across the crowd, got involved with the people, and blew himself up. In the Ben Yehuda Mall, suicide bomber, he did the same trick. This time, he dressed up the terrorists with women's clothes. Many people got killed in both attacks. A lot of students got severely injured. One of the women that got killed in the Machna Yehuda Market suicide bombing is Leah Stern, an elderly woman from Staten Island that we represent in a case against Syria and against Iran in the Federal District Court of Washington. 
Five students that got severely injured in the Ben Yehuda moral suicide bombing are represented by us in a case against Iran and against Syria in the Federal District Court of Washington. Iran didn't defend themselves. We got a judgment against Iran, which we'll be able to collect against Iranian frozen assets that are existing in the United States. The State Department opposed such type of collection. We needed to hire a lobbyist, his name is Stuart Eisenstadt, which you may know, who helped us legislate a law in the Congress in October 2002, which allows us to collect the judgment against frozen assets. Syria defends themselves. Syria hires a lawyer, an ex attorney General of the United States, named Ramsey Clark, who comes to court. But Syria is not happy about the cases, because on one hand, they want to pour millions of dollars into the hands of Hamas to kill more Jews. On the other hand, Syria does not want to be listed anymore in the watch list of the State Department. They don't want to be recognized anymore as a country that supports terrorism. They don't want the Congress to know that every other month we filed another lawsuit against them, charging them with being involved with terrorism. By the pressure of this lawsuit, we'll have Syria realize that the price of funding terrorism is too high and will have them stop funding the Palestinian terror organizations. In 1985, a cruise liner was hijacked by a Palestinian terror cell. It was an Italian cruise liner. Its name was Aquila Lauro. When they hijacked the cruise liner, they separated between the American and the Jewish passengers to the rest of the passengers. And they warned the American and the Jewish passengers that if Israel does not agree to their demands to release Palestinian prisoners, they will take each and every one of them every three hours and kill them. Israel refused to their demands. So they took the first victim, Leon Klinghofer, an early Jewish guy from New York, on his wheelchair and shot him to death. Then they took his wheelchair, his body, on his wheelchair and threw it to the ocean. They did it in front of his wife. The mastermind behind the terror attack was Muhammad Abu Abbas. Abu Abbas was able to escape to Egypt. Egypt let him run away to Italy. United States asked his extradition from the Italian government. The Italian government refused. They let him run away to Iraq. He was hiding there for many years. In 1996, we received information that Abu Abbas wants to come to Gaza to take a vote in the PNC meeting that was going on there on the time. We ran to the Israeli Supreme Court, filed a petition, and said that Abu Abbas is a terrorist and he should not be allowed to enter Israel. And if he crosses the borders of Israel, he should get arrested. The government which is the respondent in such type of motion, said that Abu Abbas is no longer involved with terrorism, that he now believes in the Oslo Accords, that he became Baal Tshuva, and he should be allowed to enter Israel. The Supreme Court allowed him to come in. He came, he took a vote, he voted against the Oslo Accords, and went back to Iraq. Three years later, we received information that Abu Abbas now wants to come and settle in Gaza. So we ran again to the Supreme Court, argued that Abu Abbas is a terrorist and he should not be allowed to enter Israel. The Supreme Court urged us to withdraw the motion. They know that any decision they will have to give in the case will be an immoral decision. They all knew who was Abu Abbas. They all knew what an evil terrorist he was. I stood in front of the judges and told them that since Leon Klinghofer's blood cries out of the depth of the ocean, I will not withdraw the lawsuit. The Supreme Court, quoting my words, said that their hands are tied from the former decision 
and they allowed him to come in. That was their decision. That was a deadly decision. One year later, we heard that Abu Abbas ran back to Iraq because he was wanted by the Israeli forces for training a terror cell in Gaza. Last year, a young boy from Neve Yaakov got killed and his body was found in Ramallah. His name was Yuri Gushchin. He was 15 years old. The group that took responsibility for the murder was Abu Abbas cell. A week beforehand, a terror attack happened in Haifa and five Israelis got severely injured. The group that sent the suicide bomber to blow the car over there was Abu Abbas cell. We filed a lawsuit against Abu Abbas behalf of the terror victims on the Akila Lauro. We sued him in the district court of Jerusalem. Abu Abbas, back in Iraq, didn't come to Israel to defend himself. The PLO, who was also defended in the case, didn't come to court and explain what Abu Abbas did on the Akila Lauro at the time. We're going to get a default judgment against them both. When we get the judgment against the PLO, we know that the PLO has assets in East Jerusalem, buildings that we will take them and collect the judgment against them. We'll take the buildings from the hands of the PLO and we'll give them to the one who deserve it most, the terror victims. The PLO will not own these buildings anymore. Two months after the beginning of the current intifada, November 2000, a school bus was blown up in Kfar Darum. Two teachers that were on the bus got killed. Many children that were on the bus got severely injured. Three of them of the same family, the Cohen family. Few hours after the bomb went off, the Cohen family's children were rushed to Tel Shomer Hospital, and the doctor said to the parents that he doesn't have a choice but to cut off the legs of two of the children. He told them, though, that the youngest child, Tehila, is safe. The next day, the doctor came back to the parents and told them that he doesn't have a choice but to cut off the legs of Tehila as well. Three young children of the same family, 12 years old, 11 years old, and 9 years old, with no legs. We filed two suits in the case, one in Israel, the other one in the United States, behalf of the American terror victims that got injured on the bus. We sued the Palestinian Authority, we sued Yasser Arafat, and we sued the one who is directly responsible for the murder, Muhammad Dahlan. Muhammad Dahlan was the head of the preventive security forces in Gaza at the time. The CIA has a tape recording of Muhammad Dahlan giving instructions to his deputy, Rashid Abu Shabak, to blow up the yellow bus. The yellow bus. They knew exactly what bus they are going to blow up. They knew the way it was going every morning from Kfar Darom to Neved Kalim. They knew the hour it was leaving Kfar Darom every morning, 7 o'clock. The bomb went off at 7.02 in the morning. They knew it was a school bus. They knew they are going to kill children. Muhammad Akhlan is now being groomed by the United States to take care of the security situation in Gaza and in the all Palestinian Authority territories. They expect him to combat terrorism. They expect him to fight Hamas, to fight the Islamic Jihad. They expect him to terminate these terror organizations. How can he do it? They intend him even to be the heir of Yasser Arafat when time comes. We will not let it happen. We will pick up a jury, and in front of 12 objective American citizens, we will prove that Muhammad Ahlan is no other than a murderer. And nobody, nobody, including the United States, should do any business with this baby's killer. This is only a portion of the cases we're handling in 
Israel in the United States, and very soon in Europe and Canada. Every day we get more and more calls from more and more terror victims who want to fight back, who are seeking justice, who want more than anything else not to be victims anymore. And we are committed to help them. We are taking all these hundreds of cases and filing them in orderly manner in the courts around the world. Shurat Adin Israel Law Center is a non-profit organization which can handle these hundreds of cases. It's a non-profit organization. All donations are tax deductible if they are made to PEF in the United States. We are committed to help them because we have no other choice. We are committed to help them because this is the way to secure the future of the orphans that lost their parents. This is the way to secure the future of the families that lost their breadwinners. This is the way to give them hope.